Now, I mentioned in part one that there was an incident on the street that Boris Johnson mentioned. Now, this led to a real newspaper sending a real journalist out to investigate the story. Now, this is investigative journalism. It's an expensive business. You've got wages to pay, expense accounts, etc. And the journalist, let's call him Tim, is on the street. He's a good journalist actually interviewing the people who were involved in the incident. He even asked if there's any CCTV he can look at to verify the versions he's been given. And a neighbour tells him, well, actually, there's a camera that's trained on the street, but it was turned off when the incident actually occurred. How many times have we heard that when some official organisation is involved? Anyway, I digress. Tim very quickly realises that it's a non-story. And he's going to have to go back to his boss, who's a bully, to tell him, I've got nothing for you. And he'll get shouted at. So Tim's a bit under pressure to think, oh, I need to come up with something to give to the boss. So then he starts to think, maybe I could put a spin on the story, give it a certain angle to make it more interesting. Now, this is where the emphasis shifts from the story itself and more towards the career of Tim and keeping his boss sweet. So he's having to, to manipulate the story in some way to make it more interesting. Now, he could argue, I haven't altered the facts. The facts are still the same. But the fact that they started to alter the interpretation of the story, because he, he might think, oh, well, there's Mr. Patel, Mr. Smith. Maybe there's a racist angle I could exploit. Well, there was a hedge involved. Perhaps there could be some humorous topiary type angle to it. Uh, and this is death by a thousand cuts, basically. These little kind of manipulations of the, of, of the story starts to affect it, starts to give it bias. It's hidden, but it's there. Anyway, he comes up with a story, and so he goes back to his office thinking, well, at least I've got something. There you are, boss, a story. And his boss says, we didn't even look at it. He says, we're not running that now. Another story has come in that's replaced it. And so Tim says, well, what story is that? I says, oh, this young girl has won a trophy at a Jim Carner. Now, it's immediately understood by Tim that this girl is the daughter of the proprietor who owns the paper. It's a commercial news outlet. It's his paper. And he knows, oh, I see, it's an editor's must. He's got to run it because it's the proprietor's daughter. Everyone in the newsroom knows the story is garbage. And the tragedy is it's displaced a story that had merit. Now, this is where any argument about a news outlet being objective, unbiased, etc., falls down because of the editor. The editor is making choices about the stories, and in particular, which stories to include, and more importantly, which stories to exclude. Because that's the really clever bit. A lot of people assume that the arguments about bias are about the stories that have been published. No, actually. A lot of the arguments are actually about the stories that haven't been published. Why hasn't that story appeared in this news outlet? Because it's a much bigger story than the ones that they've published. Now, it's a bit like a magician's trick. They have misdirection in the trick to make the, the viewer look at this significant looking movement which is just show the business end of the trick is is going on out of sight hidden and quite often that's what happens with news outlets they, they run certain stories and the idea is to distract the viewer from other stories that are more important so the classic example is benefits fraud uh, there's so many stories and tv programs run about that uh, and it's good clickbait for viewers. You know, if you're a hard-working taxpayer, you think, why are these people getting all this free money? But what they don't mention is that when the, the amount of benefit fraud is compared with uh, tax evasion, it's minuscule. Absolutely minuscule. The big story is tax evasion. Now, how many stories do you know that have been run on that? And it's not hard to see, see why that's the case, because... If it's a private, a commercial news outlet, it's owned by a billionaire usually, a rich person. And the people they're friends with are rich people as well. 
the people who are most likely to be involved in tax evasion. So it's no surprise they don't want those kind of stories going on because if the public get angry about it, they've got skin in the game. So don't run those stories. So that's where the real manipulation of the news takes place. It's the stories that aren't run. And it's such a clever trick because if it's not, if it's not run, how are you going to find out about it? You're not, are you? Unless you monitor other news outlets that have different biases. So their ideology will be different. So the chances are they might run different stories and you'll find out about them. So that's the real trouble with this whole objectivity. How, you know, what basis does an editor choose the stories? And whatever answer they give you, that's their bias. By definition, they are biased towards certain stories over others. And all the journalists working for the paper will, will pretty much share the same bias. Because they've been hired by the editor, who probably knew them beforehand and knew that they shared the same ideology. And each journalist is chained to a particular ideological post. Most of them aren't even aware of it. It's only when a journalist tries to go beyond the extent of the chain that they realise, no, I'm chained. As happened once to Peter Oborn who worked for the Daily Telegraph, I think it was. And he wrote a story about um, HSBC. And the editor of the paper said, we're not, we're not running that story. Uh, and Peter Obama said, why, why is that? And the editor said, do you know how much money HSBC spends on advertising in the Daily Telegraph? It's enormous. It practically runs the paper. We're not going to upset that customer. And that's when Peter Oborn had an epiphany. Oh, I see. I'm chained to this particular ideology and I can't go beyond it. Now, to his credit, he resigned. He had enough integrity to resign as soon as he realised, I'm, I'm not free to choose whatever story. But most journalists either don't have that integrity or they're unaware that they're chained to that ideology. So anyways, um, watch out for part three.